Hi and good morning, good evening, whatever time it is for you, and welcome to the first episode of Museum Monday where we chat about our favourite museums, artefacts and exhibitions. And what better place to start than the history of museums and museum collecting itself? Over in the British Museum there is a whole gallery about this topic, showcasing the 18th and 19th century collectors and the conclusions they made about their finds. But as you might already know, Discussions about where museums got their collections from is notoriously, well, uh, messy. So how does the British Museum tackle this sticky topic in one of its prime gallery spaces? Well get on the bus with me and let's find out. The British Museum was the first public national museum in the world. People have always loved collecting things, and so before the rise of museums there were many private collections of curiosities and things to show off after dinner. This desire for collection expanded as trade routes expanded as well. One such collector was Sir Hans Sloan, who amassed 71,000 items in his collection, which even by the standards of rich collectors at the time was pretty extreme. When Sloan died, he gave his collection to George II for the whole nation, now even the king doesn't have space for tens of thousands of books, manuscripts and natural specimen, so in 1753 the British Museum was established to house all the curiosities. Soon Sloan's collection merged with other big collections like the Montague family's house library and Sir Robert Cotton's rare and valuable manuscripts. The British Museum was unlike anything before it, it didn't belong to the church or the king, it was publicly available and aimed to collect everything of global interest. I think one misunderstanding about the British Museum comes from its name. People can be disappointed to find that it hardly contains anything actually from Britain. It is not the Museum of Britain, but the Museum in Britain. A subtle distinction that the history of museums and collecting can explain. The Enlightenment Gallery opened in 2003. It's in the King's Library, one of the oldest rooms in the museum, where as you might guess was where the King kept his library before it was moved to the British Library. The King's Library was restored to its former appearance and objects are stored in 19th century style display cases. All of this is to evoke the old cabinets of curiosity and the way that the first 18th century visitors might have encountered these objects. But throughout the exhibition we see familiar interpretation labels to help us make sense of what we're seeing. The exhibition is grouped thematically to tell the story of the collectors and thinkers who contributed to the museum's establishment. There is the natural world, the birth of archaeology, art and civilization, classifying the world, ancient scripts, ritual and religion, and trade and discovery. Back in 2003, the museum director described the Enlightenment Gallery as the culmination of the museum's 250th anniversary celebrations. So basically, it's a literal showcase of the Enlightenment intellectuals who contributed to modern understandings of the world. I've been interested in the history of museum collecting and how museums present disputed artefacts for a while. In my opinion, one good way to deal with controversial collections issues is to be open about it with visitors. There are lots of museum exhibitions that are about how the collections came to be in the museums themselves. These exhibitions can teach us about the archaeological and conservation methods, or in the case of the Enlightenment Gallery, they teach us about the physical discoveries that made people think about the world in new ways and the thinkers who ideas began the journey to our modern understandings of science, history and anthropology. This can help visitors contextualise what they're seeing and know more about how museums work, which can help inform their views of what museums should be for. The British Museum arguably has the most contested artefacts in any museum, so the Enlightenment Gallery could be an essential tool to get people thinking and talking about all things museum ethics, but how much and how well does the museum utilise the gallery space for this purpose? It might not be surprising for me to tell you that the Enlightenment Gallery hasn't stayed the same since 2003. It very much began as a presentation of the Enlightenment as a time of benevolent discovery. Even at the time, I think people might have been aware that there was a chunk of the story missing. In recent years, there have been growing calls for the British Museum to address the colonial nature of its original item acquisitions. Now, for various reasons, uncomplicated or not, these conversations can be difficult to make any progress with. In early 2020, here was the British Museum's efforts to address its disputed artefacts. I mean, is it possible to make it any less eye-catching? And then... <laughs> A 
lot of things changed last year, and one of them was that it's no longer really possible for museums to avoid making statements about colonialism. So when the British Museum reopened last year, it was with a few little refreshes to the Enlightenment Gallery. Remember our friend Sir Hans Sloan? Well, his bust was moved from its stand in the Enlightenment Gallery to a nearby display cabinet, with new interpretation labels about colonialism and imperialism. Because you guessed it, Sloan's great big collection that started the British Museum, it was all partly financed by his wife's sugar plantations in Jamaica. There are other new additions too, a big information panel to introduce the idea of colonialization's role in the museum's beginnings. Plus stickers that draw attention to objects that came to the museum through particularly nefarious means. There has been some criticism about this move, mostly that it doesn't actually address the calls for returning things from the collection. But even for the most enthusiastic museum director, putting some stickers over a display case is quick, while sourcing out insurance to move valuable historical artifacts internationally is slow. Walking around the Enlightenment Gallery, I couldn't help but notice how the new stickers and labels literally form a new layer to the museum's historical interpretation about itself. With the most long-established museums, it's becoming clear that they themselves are a primary source about the history of ideas, and they're no longer just a vehicle for public education as they were first intended. In this exhibition, we can see how the British Museum has desired to present itself in the public eye and how that has changed, or has been forced to change, over the past two decades. But I couldn't help feeling a separateness between the original exhibition story about those clever Enlightenment thinkers and the post-colonial stickers pasted over the glass. Originally, the history of the gallery brought out the shadows were the women collectors whose knowledge and artifacts contributed to the museum as much as the men's. But now the history coming into the light is about the people to whom these same artifacts belongs before our Enlightenment thinkers turned up. There is something about the Enlightenment Gallery's overall themes that does not lend itself to a natural progression towards post-colonial museology. So yeah, that was getting a bit heavy thinking before lunch, so it was time to skitter off to the Museum Cafe for some sustenance. Museum Cafe review? Let's do it. As for their main ambience, it's pretty straightforward, just in the main hall with basic seats and chairs and stuff. And of course this wonderful totem pole from the indigenous population in Canada. I'm assuming because this was the only space big enough to fit it. So yeah, while you're having your lovely cake, you can have a little read about the totally legit circumstances that got the totem pole here. Oh, and of course, there's a donation point for all of your spare change after lunch. I decided to go for a tea, a millionaire shortbread, and a Christmas vegan sandwich, because, you know, it's that time of year, isn't it? Yeah, there's me enjoying the tea. You know, it's just tea, pretty basic, can't go wrong there. Got a little grey to sort of fit the mood a bit. And then I went on to try the sandwich, and, um, hmm... Well, let's just say any sandwich that you have to spend 30 seconds convincing yourself to like is a definite miss. Vegan Christmas sandwiches really need to up their game because carrots and cranberry sauce does not cut it. But luckily I finished it off on a high with a meat in their shortbread, which is pretty good. Yeah, this is my view from the sea. I mean, it kind of feels like a cafe just sort of tacked onto the main hall. And like, yeah, the view is pretty cool, but you know, it's not exactly the Louvre. Now considering the nearly eight pounds I spent on some slightly mediocre snacks, it was time to give my verdict. I'm sorry, eat before you go. Next, I decided to have a little wander to see the rest of the stuff in this huge museum, and to my joy, I discovered a staircase that takes you to the Japan, China, and Korea rooms without having to walk through the Egyptian mummies exhibition. Now, this might not seem like a big deal to a lot of people, but every other time I've been in a hurry or with other people and always ended up using the main route past the mummies. Ever since I first saw them, I felt extremely uncomfortable in that room, and I've since realised that's because I fundamentally disagree with human remains being on public display indefinitely. So finding a way to the galleries behind the mummies without actually having to walk past them made me very happy. Here is my excitement rushing to the Japan gallery. I felt like I was in that TikTok trend from earlier this year. This gallery isn't on the prime routes around the museum, but it's definitely worth running up the back stairs. Like, look at this samurai armour. It's so cool. And there is a replica of a traditional tea house, and all kinds of artworks. It's great. Anyway, then it was time to return to the actual purpose of my visit, and to go and see a few of those artefacts with disputed ownership. And the perks of visiting a museum on a Monday during a panini is that there's hardly anyone there. Here is the Rosetta Stone. I could just walk right up to it and read about all the hieroglyphics. I didn't have to jump to see it or try to sneak through a crowd. It was amazing. I returned again to the idea of what should be displayed in the British Museum because on this visit I really hadn't seen many British things in the British Museum. 
Maybe think of it instead as a focal point of world history, where items of historical significance are clustered together under one roof so anyone who visits can understand the world in its varied and rich and vibrant context. Comparing and contrasting, but also sensing the similarities. Don't think this conversation is new. In 1993, David Wilson, the director of the British Museum at the time, said, A national museum which displays and collects objects illustrative of the history of a culture naturally instills in the inhabitants of that country pride in their nationhood, and also engenders some element of humility in a nation by showing that a country is not unique unto itself. He also says that returning objects to the country where they came from would be to perpetrate cultural vandalism on a scale undreamt of since the Second World War. But mostly he's advocating for international museums as centres of global learning, the cross-pollination of ideas, and as the antithesis to destructive nationalism. He describes a utopian world where national and international museums around the world work collaboratively to promote understanding and appreciation of all cultures. This sentiment is echoed by the museum director from when the Enlightenment Gallery was opened in 2003. Neil McGregor claims the museum's purpose is to allow visitors to address through objects both ancient and more recent questions of contemporary politics and international relations. The British Museum's collection can, in his view, go as far as to forge thoughts and discussions that can oppose disastrous international conflicts. It is a machine to generate tolerance. But what does he have to say about the British Museum's heavily contested claim to the Benin Bronzes? Out of the terrible circumstances of the 1897 dispersal, a new, more securely grounded view of Africa and African culture could be formed. What Wilson and McGregor are describing is the notion of the Universal Museum, a self-proclaimed term for museums that say they bring together the different cultural traditions of humanity under one roof, and provide them with a worldwide context within which their full significance is graspable as nowhere else. I hope now you understand a little more about the perspective that went into the creation of the Enlightenment Gallery. The British Museum got its first collections from Enlightenment thinkers who gathered their curiosities of the world in ways that were groundbreaking for some and destructive for others. Now it is one of the largest institutions of its kind with a worldwide collection that allows each object to be contextualised against everything else like it. But how well can it hope to achieve this vision? Criticism towards the notion of the Universal Museum is how, in their focus to define and study the other, they neglect to consider their most near society. How much does this othering of faraway cultures from an outside position actually contribute to solid understandings of those cultures? And how much does it lead to a critical awareness of ourselves? Felicity Bodenstein concludes that the Enlightenment Gallery is intended as an argument for the value of the Enlightenment and a means of reinforcing the museum's present and future status. And I can't help agree. Can the Enlightenment Gallery properly explain its artifact's provenance when it is also a justification for its home's existence? How much does pasting stickers over glass really address the issues of colonialism and repatriation? I'll finish with some words from Georgia Bungu, former Director General of the National Museum of Kenya. I strongly contest the idea that some museums may call themselves universal museums. Surely all museums share a common mission and a shared vision. Do Universal Museums claim to be universal on the grounds of their size, their collections, how rich they are? <laughs>